The following is a presentation from the MJ Cast, the internet's premier podcast on all things Michael Jackson. I'm a black American. I am proud of who I am. Together, we can make a change in the world. I want to see you! <laughs> I like to take sounds and put them on the microscope. There's a driving bass, you become the bass. Let the music write itself. I don't sing it if I don't mean it. <laughs> Welcome to the MJ Cast, your source of news, discussion, and interviews on the King of Pop. Hello and welcome to episode 144 of the MJ Cast. I'm your host, Elise Capron, signing in from Studio San Diego. And today I am so excited to be joined by some of our super old school MJ Cast team. I have the one and only Q back on the show. Welcome, Q. I'm so happy to have you here. Whoa, top billing. I wasn't expecting that. Hello, everyone. Of course, top billing. <laughs> and we also have the brilliant and wonderful. Damien Shields. Damien, it has been a long time since you've been on the show. I mean, I don't even remember. Gosh, it's been probably been a, at least, what, a year and a half or two years. I think the last time I was on was just with you, I think. Yes, we did a regular news episode chat, which was super fun. Yes. Yeah, it was quite yes, a while ago. I also do want to mention, just because, Damon, you haven't been on the show for a while, if any listeners are newer to the MJ cast, Damien is not only an incredible fan and person on Twitter, but also is a journalist. With the best hair in the business. With the best, the best hair, hair in the business. In the business. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but he's also a journalist and an author, and you should absolutely 100% check out his book, Michael Jackson Songs and Stories from the Vault. It's incredible. It's about the Escape album and all the origins of all of those songs. And it's just fantastic. And he's doing all kinds of incredibly interesting projects that we're going to be hearing about eventually. Oh, you also had your thriller project as well that came out last year. When did that? Was it? Oh, it was over a year ago now, wasn't it? It was in July 2020. Oh my gosh. What? That's crazy. Almost two years ago. Oh my yeah. gosh. Whoa. Where has the time gone? <laughs> Which means it's been more than two years since I was on the show because that that, that wasn't out when I was on the show. That's last, true. With you, Elise. Oh my goodness. Wow. And where can people find that thriller podcast documentary, Damien? Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. It's called The Genesis of Thriller. Mm. And it just, yeah, it basically takes you into the studio and, and lets you experience the making of that album through the eyes and ears of the people who worked on it. It's Quincy Jones, Bruce Wadeen, Rod Temperton, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson's like the main character through the thing. You know, as all the songs come to life, the process, you know, how the whole thing evolved, what the mission was in the beginning and what the end, the end product was. So... Um, yeah, basically from the, from the first recordings of the first demos until the album was released, everything in between there and nothing beyond. And it's fantastic. Tune in, get it. It's free. It's free. Yeah. I am subscribing now. Well, so excited to have you back and we can't wait to hear everything that you have been up to. And then we have our fantastic audio editor and um, frequent co-host as well these days, Charlie Carter. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you, Elise. Welcome, Damien. Welcome, Q. Good to have you along. Happy to be here. So, so happy to be here. And I do want to make a little special note that this episode is dedicated to our friend and show founder and co-host, Jamin. Uh, The reason he is not on the show today is because of many reasons, so many reasons. Number one, he is incredibly busy with work. Number two, he is not feeling well. He's been ill. And number three, he has baby number two arriving literally any moment. So he's got a lot on his plate. We so wish he could be here. He was originally supposed to record this episode with Damien. But uh, Jamin, we are thinking of you. We love you. We're so excited to hear about baby number two and can't wait for all your news and hope you get a little bit of time to relax too because you have a lot on your plate. But yeah, super excited to be here with you guys. And also, this is the first, it's May, it's almost June, in fact, and this is the first news episode we've done this season. So we have a ton to catch up on, although we're going to focus on some of the more current news. We're not going to go way back to January. Um, But yeah, I'm really excited to be here and just chat with you guys. How have you been? Tell us a little bit about your updates in your lives. 
it has been a crazy... It feels like five years worth of stuff has happened since then alone. Like, oh my God, I wouldn't even know where to start. Uh, congratulations to Ukraine for y- winning Eurovision. That was amazing. Well done to Sheldon Riley for doing so well for Australia at Eurovision, getting to the grand final. What else? Uh, my COVID survivor had that. Luckily, thank you for science and three vaccinations. It was a relatively mild case. The The husband currently has it, even a milder case than what I had. Um, Mum and dad have just finishing recovering from that as well. Oh my gosh, um, I got all of you guys. Pretty much. My brother had it quite bad, actually. He did not have a good time with it, but he's doing better now. What else? Big news for work. Monday, tomorrow. uh, So we're recording this on, what, the 22nd of May. Uh, So tomorrow will be my first duty back flying on an aircraft since june 2021 my shoulder injury has healed enough that i've been cleared to go back to work i had exams for my emergency procedures last week in case you didn't know listeners i'm a flight attendant and flight attendants have recurrent exams usually every six to 12 months so i was well overdue for my emergency procedures exams and had those over east this week just finished and i passed those with flying colors but because i hadn't been on an aircraft since june it was very stressful and nerve-wracking that's 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 enough that's enough news we just <laughs> I can't oh, believe we, and, june, cute. and june. i know right june last year was the last time i that was when i got put on ground duties because of my injury and the rehab that the recovery needed so oh and then other big news australia just had its election federal election yesterday and we finally kicked out that horrendous idiot stupid liberal government and scomo so Bye, Beesh. You're gone. So Yeah, he, he and, can go home like he told all the international people in our country in the yes. biggest crisis in modern humanity. That's go it. home. Go home so, and don't come home. back. You're not allowed yep. to come back and you're not allowed to leave to go visit anyone overseas. And fuck, so many reasons that it's great that he is gone and the Greens picked up more seats. Well done over there in Queensland, Damien. Greensland, we're now going to call it. Got a few extra <laughs> seats there, which we're very happy with. So that was great news from last night. We now have a new prime minister and a new party in charge. Thank God. That's great. Yay. And uh, Damien, you have been, I know, working away on a project which we will hear about at some point when it's ready. And I know you've been working a lot and tweeting a lot and putting out all kinds of great commentary on, on Twitter. So thank you for all of that as always. Yeah, usually when I'm tweeting a lot, it's when I'm agitated. So I'm sorry about that, but um, you know, we love your agitation. The people in my the people in my private life, I don't talk about Michael Jackson with them because they're my my normal kind of people. So <laughs> if I have something that I really need to get off my chest, it usually goes on Twitter, and then yeah, you all have to deal with that. So sorry. <laughs> It's always so well said and so well thought through. I am in a place in, with Twitter right now where I think I'm no, still... No, you should see my drafts, Elise. <laughs> my drafts. My, my drafts are how I really, really, really feel. Oh. And then what I actually tweet is like super duper self-censored Damien. So just <laughs> times it by 100 and then just imagine what could be in my drafts. It's... <laughs> well, I think maybe maybe one look. day in like 20 years I'll go through my drafts I'll publish all my drafts because <laughs> they're out of control yeah <laughs> you should I would like to, to see what they say yeah I feel like Heck I'm yes. lucky right now if my tweets don't have 45 typos in them um I feel like I'm still in in mom brain mode in a lot of ways <laughs> but uh, but I do what I can so and then uh, Carter uh, let us know how you've been since the last time we heard from you on the show Oh, I can't complain, Elise, and if I do, no one listens. You know how it is. <laughs> You've literally got a whole bunch of listeners right now. <laughs> Tuning right, in. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, wrap it up within a minute then. Oh, I've done done a fair bit of flying in the last couple of months. Now, Q, uh, this is something that we've been waiting a long time for, the ability to talk aeroplanes, but we probably shouldn't do it in this forum. But, yeah, it's exciting to be on a show with the with the three of you and, and Q and Damien. Uh, haven't had the chance to speak with you privately and now the, the chance to, to record with you. I haven't been this excited since I ordered Uber Eats and it turned up hot. <laughs> but, you know what's crazy, though? I feel like we've spoken endlessly and it 
I actually <laughs> didn't realize we've never spoken before because I listen to you so much on this podcast that I I I forgot that I don't, I don't actually know you. So yeah, save for the odd tweet here and there. Uh, yeah, well, it's nice to meet you. Hi. Really, yeah, you too. Yeah. <laughs> and you're only an hour up the uh, well, not up the road. About eight hours up the road, but uh, only an hour flight away. So if you get bored and decide to come to Sydney, any of you, hit me yeah. up. I'll, I'll be there this year at some point, so I'll hit you up. Yeah. Uh, and the other the big piece of news, which depending on when this goes out, if it's June by the time this goes out, there's a good chance I'll be in the UK because we're oh. doing a secret trip. Next Sunday we leave. And Q, I, I, they haven't changed my flight yet. At the moment, Qantas to, to London goes via Darwin. But they're opening the Perth flight up, so ours hasn't been changed yet. Okay. If it does, I'm going to be in contact with you, don't you worry. But yes, we're going <laughs> over to the UK in uh, in secret. My mum and dad don't know. Oh, that's so exciting. So there's a, yeah, to introduce uh, little baby Josie to them for the first time. I hope they don't have a heart attack and fall over because that would be against the uh, intentions of the trip. Um, but yeah, we're... we're Looking forward to going back to the UK. I haven't been back in, in six years, so I haven't seen my sister in six years. Um, haven't seen my parents since before COVID, so I'm really looking forward to getting over there. Can and hopefully meet up with uh, old mate Charlie Thompson as well. Oh, yes. Please, two things, two favours to us. Mm-hmm. Please have someone video your reunion with your family. Oh, yes. Because I, I oh, just yes. love watching those, like, reunification videos of families that have been separated or, you know, dads coming back from, uh, like, fighting overseas or something. Like, I always totally get teared up when there's surprise yeah. videos. Um, and, yes, do a little video when you meet Charlie Thompson, please, as well. That would be really cool. <laughs> Give him a yeah, big well, hug we're, we're from us. Have... He seems like a hugger. I will do. He seems like such a hugger, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta take some photos we'll we can put on well, Twitter I'll, too. Yes, I'll uh, I'll, I'll let him make the f- first move. How's that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> love to you, Charlie Thompson. <laughs> we love all the Charlies. <laughs> I've hugged Charlie Thompson, so there you go. Hmm. Oh, jealous! <laughs> <laughs> I have hugged Charlie Thompson too. He's a wonderful, jealous. wonderful little human being. We love Charlie, and. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I'm so glad to hear it from you guys again. And I did not even think about the fact we were doing introductions right on the show. Even more exciting. Um, I have been busy, busy, busy here, just kind of getting used to being a mom. And and so haven't I, I've been on a few episodes the last few months, but I probably was a little bit delirious still. So I think I'm finally getting to the place of feeling a little bit more like a human. So all that's very good. And I am, again, wishing Jamin the best with number two, because right now having one, I don't have any idea how people have two children and survive. So (laughs) good luck, Jamin. (laughs) I want to do a quick shout out to both Elise and Carter. Elise, the episodes you've been on have been amazing. And I've actually been blown away that you've been able to do as much as you have oh, you're sweet. <laughs> with a newborn. And the same goes for Carter. Uh, your editing has been amazing. Uh, the episodes have oh, been you. really great listening that you've been able to put together and the ones that you've been on. But the same goes for you with uh, a little one as well. Like hats off to you both for the Thank amazing you. effort that you have been putting into this to keep this machine running for all of the listeners out there. So well done to you both. Thank you. That is very Thank you very sweet. much. That's very kind of you. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's been great. I think that is the reason our, our season has had a little bit of a slower start this year. So thanks everybody for your patience too with that. But we have some really exciting stuff coming and I'm um, excited to dive into mm. some news right now. So let's get started because we have quite a bit to get through and we have a fiery main discussion topic as well that we're going to get to that I know Damien especially is going to have some thoughts on. But yeah, let's just jump in. So let's start first of all with MJ the musical, which of course we've been talking about for quite a while now. And at this point, a lot of our fan friends have seen. It has just been announced recently that they have earned 10 Tony nominations, which is a huge deal. And they're going to be going on tour around North America in 2023 um, and a few other pieces of news around that. But first of all, with the Tony nominations, it's pretty, pretty impressive, really. Um, 
So they're being nominated in the categories of best musical, best direction of a musical, best performance by a leading actor, best book, best scenic design, costume design, lighting design, sound design, choreography, and orchestrations. So yeah, pretty impressive. I'm really curious actually about kind of at this stage with this production everything we've seen, the reports we've seen from other fans, personal feelings about kind of what we're seeing come out around this production. How do you guys feel at this point as opposed to a year ago about MJ the Musical? Q, do you want to start? I'm really happy that they have been nominated for 10 awards. Clearly the show is not a flop. Otherwise, one, it would have possibly already closed let alone uh, about to embark on North American tour and there are possibly whispers of maybe international touring show version of it in the future as well. So I'm glad that it hasn't flopped. Like, I'm glad that, you know, the whole cancelling a Michael thing, obviously we know didn't work, but there had still been some ramifications from that. So I'm, I'm glad that the show is doing well and has been received well enough to have had these nominations. So obviously, you know, it's not like a 100% accurate sort of based on true events kind of script, a storybook, but it is out there creating a lot of fans. People are enjoying the show a lot. People are enjoying the music a lot. And that's really only a positive thing. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, Would either of you guys like to chime in further beyond that? I agree with Q. I mean, it's a jukebox musical, but which artist has the strongest jukebox of hits? It's it's got to be Michael. So it's no wonder that it's being so well received for what it is. Based on that clip that we saw that came out of the opening, and this is just objectively for me personally, as somebody who would, if I was going to the theatre, what would I want to see? I wouldn't want to see a jukebox kind of like a tribute show musical trying to recreate Michael and recreate the numbers and blah, blah, blah. I thought if they had something in a, in a theater setting, like a, a proper musical would have been nice to be able to see like real Broadway interpretations of all of the stuff because trying to recreate Michael, you're just giving us, you know, somebody else's impersonation of him. And I don't, I don't, you know, that wasn't what I was expecting, but in the same token, it's being very well received. Like I have very scarcely seen anybody say anything negative about the show. I haven't seen the show, so I can't comment on the actual content of the whole show or the script even. I haven't really seen it. I've only heard what people have said. And the you know, the fact that it's being nominated for awards mean that people who know about musicals and people who are in a position of authority to comment on whether this is a good musical or not clearly believe it is. So... It can only be a good thing for Michael's legacy to have his music in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of new viewers and presented in a way that's being nominated, you know, in the top echelon of the most prestigious awards you could possibly be nominated for. It has to be a plus. So, you know, my subjective opinion about the content aside, I think it's amazing, really. The same thing with Cirque du Soleil uh, in, in, yes. in Vegas. It's the same thing. It's like... That's why that show works so well. It's because it's not trying to exactly recreate what Michael did because yeah. like is true you just can't you cannot get to that level it's a interpretation of it and a platform to showcase the material and that's why the one Vegas show works so well and that is exactly why this Broadway interpretation is clearly hitting the mark as well which is yeah. great news yeah I, I've seen the the one in Vegas MJ1 and I think that's a you know, a great thing for Michael's legacy. Again, it can only be a good thing. These, It's actually quite a spectacular show, the MJ1. It's fantastic, but, um, yeah. I'm not sure that I'm going to ever endeavor to see the musical. Doesn't seem, based on what I have seen, to be up my alley. Something that would appeal to me personally. I just want the real Michael. I don't want to see other people trying to interpret him or recreate him. I just want him. So, and it's not him, so... I'm sort of with you on that one, Damien, in that uh, when I go and see a Michael Jackson show, I know I'm going to be disappointed because it's not Michael Jackson. Having said that, I've also seen the uh, MJ1 
in uh, in Las Vegas in the Mandalay Bay, and it's up there with one of the best live performances I've ever seen, particularly of Billie Jean. And uh, you know the lights going through the suits and the moon walking up the wall. It was just fantastic. I've also seen Thriller Live here in Sydney, and I've seen another Michael Jackson show that I can't remember exactly what it was called at the Olympic Park. So I sort of go into it wanting it to be as accurate and as close to Michael as possible and knowing that I'm going to be disappointed because it's not Michael, but also enjoying it and being able to see the artistic interpretation that these guys have put on it. But by far and away, uh, MJ1 is the best one I've seen. As for the one uh, in New York right now, MJ the Musical, I'm probably not going to make a special trip to see it because I can't afford it other than anything else. But uh, if it comes to Sydney or somewhere close by in Australia, I'd, I'd certainly be interested to go and see because when we first spoke about it on this show as well, some of the reviews, they said overall it was a good show, but then they'd say things like using the wrong music in the wrong part or misinterpreting what the songs mean, like money, um, with questionable antics from the character playing Joe Jackson and actors playing more than one character. But I'm going to reserve judgment until I've seen it, but I don't know when that will be. Yeah, yeah if it comes to Australia... I mean, we're so isolated over here. Three of us on this call are in Australia and we're so far away from everything else. Even some mm. people in other countries, they have countries that are close by that they can, you know, country hop and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm in France, but I'm going to go to England to watch it. It's not mm. like that for us. We can't do that. So unless it actually does come here, it's practically impossible for us to, to see these kinds of things. You know, unless you're taking a once in a lifetime huge international trip to go somewhere, but you don't just do that to see a musical, right? So it's very, very difficult for us to, to make those plans. But um, if it does come here, that won't be a huge endeavor to go and check it out. I'm probably with you on that. If it comes here, I might, I might check it out. Um, depends how my mood it might is. Might be that an week. excuse for the four of us <laughs> to get together. Yeah, yeah, it could be great. But on the plus side, you guys live in magical Kangaroo Island, so. You know, I don't get to do that. <laughs> we really do. Kangaroos <laughs> everywhere. That's not that's not a myth for any of the listeners who have no idea about Australia. Like when I'm driving around, just the I, I live in a part of Australia called the Gold Coast. There are literally kangaroos everywhere. People's front yards, crossing the road, like they're out there. They're the the <laughs> they're everywhere. You have to I be have careful. To say, Damien, not. In, it's it's even sub, in, in suburbs, like with neighborhoods and houses and built up areas. You have to be on the lookout because they're across the road, they're in the parks, they're in your front yard, they're in your backyard, they're everywhere. <laughs> I can't tell if he's being serious. No, 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 I really am. <laughs> no, he is. I've seen him in, uh, in a garden that I lived in when I first came over to Sydney. I've actually had the privilege of working with a lot of Australian animals, you know, from snakes and lizards to, to crocodiles and alligators. And Well, alligators are obviously not Australian, but... The funniest thing I've ever seen is a kangaroo turn around to kick a tourist because it didn't want to have a photo taken. <laughs> uh, Elise, was it you that I sent photo to the other week when we had a little native animal on the driveway? Yes, I yes. I don't remember uh, what yeah, it was So called. we don't, even though we're actually quite close to where there is some bush and farms and things, it is definitely building up to be like a suburban, like sprawl situation. But we haven't had kangaroos like on our street, but we did have a little, I think it was a quenda, which is a little, I'm guessing a marsupial that was on our driveway a few weeks ago. And that was the first time I've seen one of those like in a front lawn and not like in a park reserve, nature reserve kind of thing. So that was pretty cool. That was very cool. I can't even wrap my head around having all these creatures around me, but um, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is very cool. But we should get back to so MJ the musical. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> um, first of all, I do want to say in our show notes we will have a link if you have not seen it to the opening song, which is I believe a version of "Beat It," which they they released on Instagram and and social media. So that will be there if you have not seen it. And I did just want to add a couple things here. So. I also have heard only positive stuff from friends who have gone to see it in New York, um, except for like, I think Carter, you mentioned that kind of issues around like the money, the use of the song money, things like that. But I think I probably will ultimately see it if it does tour around. I was very tempted to go to New York. But I do also have this question of, you know, when this production first was announced, we were all kind of in a rage over 
Lynn Nottage, the the playwright, and the fact that she was being, you know, she really would not come out and say that she felt that Michael Jackson was innocent of his accusations. And that was something a lot of us were holding against this production. And I've kind of been thinking about that lately. And I also recently read an interview in the New York Times. They did a big piece on this Miles Frost, who is plays Michael Jackson, who's quite an interesting guy. He kind of came out of nowhere. They also asked him about the accusations. And I noticed he kind of gave the same sort of response. And I've been thinking about that a bit. And just I'm just wondering if not that it's an excuse. I think these people should come out and say that he was innocent, that sort of thing. But I wonder if they've actually told these people that all the people involved that they just can't even go there because I like a gag order. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I, and I wonder if we've kind of held that against Lynn Nottage, maybe incorrectly. I don't know, but you have to think. So this is the kind of production that is really appealing to like the absolute mainstream. Like a lot of the friends who have gone have said that the vast majority of people there seem to not even really be like part of the fan community, that it really is speaking to just kind of general audience, which I think is the best thing we could hope for, right? But I wonder if some of these people, if they were coming out in interviews and kind of going on about Michael Jackson's innocence, if that would somehow like if the estate maybe or whoever, whichever higher up teams think that that would somehow kind of backfire against mainstream people coming and just even making it an issue or part of the conversation. Do you guys have any thoughts about that at all? This was kind of floating around in my brain as I was thinking about my kind of change in feelings from even a few months ago about this show. Well, I think that Miles Frost and and whoever else is in the show they're in the show based on their artistic merits and their ability to perform the role that they've been cast for better than the other people that were available. They're not cast as ambassadors for this or for that. They're performers, right? It's like, you know, it's like asking an actor in a film who's betraying the role of an accused, an alleged serial killer, like, what do you really think about this? But like, who cares? Honestly, who cares what they think about it, really? And... Maybe not talking about it is the best thing. Maybe being vague and just saying, look, I'm doing my job and take the role that I've given you and the performance that I've given you on its merits and leave me alone. It's not It's not these people's jobs to be out there fighting the fight, that fight, their performers. I think it's just, that's the estate's job to fight that fight. That The estate doesn't want to do that. So, I mean, it's not Miles Frost's job to defend Michael Jackson. It's the estate's job. And they are very reluctant to do it. Maybe they've instructed other people to not do it. But for me, even if Miles Frost just flat out didn't want to be an ambassador for, for this or for that, I would not hold it against him at all. I think he's he's seems to be doing a good job at what he was hired to do. And it, he should be left alone beyond that. He shouldn't be expected to, to go anywhere above and beyond his his pay. He's the performer. That's it. If he wants to go above and beyond, you know, great, do it, whatever. But he shouldn't be expected to. I I think that the possibility of the cast and production team faces behind this have been told not to talk about it. I think that's a very strong possibility. If they did not have those instructions, if they didn't have a gag order and they did have an opinion one way or the other, I would be quite fine for them to share it, especially if it was positive opinion on Michael and the facts behind the allegations, if they knew about it, which a lot of people don't also research and, you know, haven't read the court transcripts. They don't know the actual history of these things because it's not part of their job. And they're not like a whole, they're not like trawling the MJ fandom just to hire MJ super fans to be in these productions. So like, again, they're not going to know the whole history. If they did have an opinion and if they were able to share it and someone asked them about it, that would, I would be fine with them answering. But I do think that a gag order situation and like non-disclosure thing or whatever, like don't talk about this. I definitely think that's in their contracts for sure. 
Great. So yeah, moving on to our next topic. This is a, a quick but an important one. So it's exciting news that King Vincent has returned after a COVID hiatus. It's going to be taking place on September 17th and 18th, 2022 in London. And there's some real great guests that have are, are already confirmed to be part of this, several of whom have been on the MJ cast before. There'll be Lavelle Smith Jr., Bill Petrell, very exciting, Kevin Dorsey and Alan Scanlon, and I'm sure some others to be in announced later on. But this is great news. I know that this is quite an amazing event. I've never had the chance to go. But I actually know some folks from the US fan friends are actually are actually going. So um, in fact, I think MJ Giving Tree is going and it's going to have like a booth there. Pretty big deal. So oh, um, that's a great I know. Idea. I know. Isn't that great? She's if shout out to MJ Giving yeah. Tree. I love her. Yeah. I love her bracelets. She makes really beautiful bracelets and other MJ inspired jewelry, which if you have not checked out, you should go do that. She's a great friend of, of our team. But yeah, this is pretty cool. Now I have to ask Carter, have you ever been in the UK when this has been going on? Have you had the chance to go to Kingvention? Uh, I'm sure I've been there when it's been on, but I haven't been aware of it until the last couple of years. In fact, until the guys came on the show, I think I bought something from one of them a couple of years ago, a t-shirt or something. So no, I've not had the chance. And unfortunately, it's going to be in September and I, I'll be back in Australia by then. But I mean, just going to put it out there for, for the guests that they want to invite to these things and any of them that are based on the West Coast of the USA, it's it's only a couple of hours extra flying to get to Sydney or Brisbane from, <laughs> from LA. You know, I mean, I'm sure that we could arrange an Australian convention. And let's not forget that Michael Jackson actually got married in Sydney. So there is a link. <laughs> Bring it out here, guys. Yes, we should. I I love it. I think we should make that happen. We certainly have the amazing fan community to support it um, in Australia. So for sure. Do you know whereabouts in the UK they're holding it? London's Shaw Theatre. Well, you can see in our show notes, we'll have a link there. And you can also go to their main website, which is kingvention.com. They have a very fancy website with lots of videos and Pez Jacks, of course, at the center of everything. If you haven't heard our interview with Pez, it's a really interesting one. Um, But yeah, check it out. If you happen to be in Europe, you should definitely get yourself over to London in September. Especially for that roster of guests, folks. Like, you know, we have had the pleasure of chatting with um, a number of those and like, wow, to, to hear from them in person it would be incredible. Like the stories that those people have, they're the stories that definitely deserve to be heard. And I'm, I'm stoked. I'm so happy that Kingvention was able to get these guests and I'm sure the ones that haven't been announced yet. But yeah, I'm so happy that like people are going to be hearing from Big Al like about Neverland because the insight that he had, that was absolutely one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. Absolutely. And there really is nothing like seeing these people in person and getting to hear their stories. It's so special. I actually will be going to Brad Sundberg's in the studio with MJ in LA next month. That's also just been slowly coming back to in-person events. And it's just, it's such an incredible um, thing. It's, you just, ha- you have these moments that you never forget. And I will never forget Vincent Patterson, like showing us his, his zombie shirt. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. The beat it shirt <laughs> he wore, which was so tiny. It looked like it would like fit on my arm. It was very, <laughs> very small. And he had his uh, zombie teeth from the thriller video too. And these just amazing moments and these guests get teary and it's really incredible. So, um, so yeah, fully agree. It's a very special thing. And hopefully someday we can get Bill Patrell on the show. That would be awesome too so we have our own little guest wish list from the people uh, who will be at convention if any of you get to meet bill patrell please say tell him he needs to come on the mj cast <laughs> yeah mm. he, yeah he's one of the most interesting people i think you should definitely continue the endeavor to oh, get we him. have we have and, tried we're gonna keep trying oh yeah yeah and i didn't really contribute to that conversation but you have to say a huge um congratulations and and well done to, to pez and, and the team for getting that off the ground again. It would, would have been really easy to just say, oh, like the pandemic's ruined it. We've lost the momentum. 
it's over. King Convention's done. It's it, it has been what it has been. But to, to revive it and bring it back and get people in an environment where it's not as easy to fly and move and, and go places to places and they've still managed to get a stellar group of, of talking heads to come and be part of this and to interact with Michael's fans and to share who Michael was with them. Uh, in the circumstances, it's even more admirable that they've been able to, to continue it. And yeah, anybody in that area should should check that out for sure. I mean, these are the things the estate should be doing. Well yep. done to... C- credit to the fans doing yeah. the heavy lifting again, as yep. always, as always. Yeah, yeah. And with, with limited resources. I mean, it's not like they've made $2.6 billion in the last 12 years to throw it at something like this, <laughs> right? You know, it, I mean, it's but seriously, I mean, it's a snarky comment, but like, it's true. These These people are just everyday people like us. And look what they're managing to bring to fans so who have yeah, who have bravo. day jobs bravo and them. and yeah, run websites and still manage to put on a humongous super like high profile com- convention i don't know how it happens it's amazing oh, even just there where even just the mj vibe website like whenever there's news you can go to the mj vibe website within hours and the news is documented there with an article like that takes time that takes it's that takes you ha- away from whatever your normal life is to sit down and do that and get it online and make sure it's, you know, right and has a nice picture and it, everything is... It's not just like it happens. You don't just... <laughs> these things take effort. That takes effort. An event takes effort. Coordinating all of the people to come takes effort. Getting a venue takes effort. You know, having it catered, having security, having people to take tickets, having all of that stuff. It takes a huge amount of effort. Not so, even to mention expense. Yeah. And it's not their job. It's not, it's not their responsibility. So again, it's the responsibility of somebody else to do things like that. Yet we are, you know, carrying that load. And in this case, the Kingvention team just bravo, bravo to them for sure. Absolutely, totally agree. So moving on, there's an exciting new docu series that's available on YouTube called Beyond the Saturday Sun, and season one, which has is up to five episodes have now been released is about the making of the, they don't care about us Brazil video. Um, so this is a really interesting project. I did get a chance to watch all of the five episodes so far. They're, they're short. You can watch them in a, in a pretty quickly. Um, and they're made uh, by Manu. I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly. Manu Bezenmat. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. But yeah, this is a really cool project. I know that Damien, I think you may have watched them the most closely of all of us. So would you like to start us off on this topic? Well, I've actually only watched the first two and a half of them. I've been extraordinarily busy in, in my normal life. But what I've seen of them so far, I think is just extraordinary. The amount of effort and the quality of the product is just, it's very, very, very good. These stories for me are are super, super interesting because these are the stories that nobody else is going to tell. If somebody like Manu doesn't go and tell these stories, you will never, ever hear them. And for them to be documented in the way that they have been with such care and attention to the accuracy of the story and the, the, the nuances and the minute details that would just be forgotten, I think it's absolutely astonishing. And these are the kinds of products and projects that I like. So... For me, I was really excited when I saw this coming out, and um, I think it's everything that it needs to be. It's beautiful. It's definitely done with a lot of love and a lot of effort. I would encourage all the listeners to go and check them out. And the beautiful thing is the episodes. If you think of it's a you know five part docu series, you're not investing five hours in it. These episodes are like you know five to ten minutes, so you can really get through them, and they're kind of dynamic. They give you everything you need to know. They're very isolated in their subjects, so you're not going to be bombarded by useless information. You're not going to be seeing four hours of drone footage. It's going to be the story focused, the facts that you need in a really clear and concise way. And I actually was halfway through episode three before we started this recording, so I'll get back to it and I'll eventually get through the others. Um, I've been sharing them anyway, even though I haven't watched all of them. Based on the first two and a half, I'm very happy to to recommend it because it's yeah for me excellent yeah I, I fully agree I highly recommend I have watched all five I would actually like to re-watch them because I would watch them watch them kind of quickly but definitely go check these out there are more coming the first several in the series I think maybe the first three or even four go in depth with really talking about all the ways they tried to kind of 
legally stop the filming of the video from happening, which is quite interesting. A very like tangled, you know, with the Olympics and kind of different political things going on. And then when you get into episode five, it really gets into all the details of the actual filming itself. But there's tons of great archival video and photos. There are some drone shots, but they're very beautiful and <laughs> of the Brazilian beaches. <laughs> and yeah, uh, but they take you on a journey, right? They, they take you on a journey. Some drone exactly. shots of going when she's going to the courthouse exactly. to, to read the documents. You're there with her, exactly. even though, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's beautifully illustrated with those visuals. It's not just drone shots for this, for the sake of drone shots. Exactly. It's beautifully, it's, it take it, it enhances the journey. Yeah. It adds another dimension to what she's narrating to you, the story she's telling you, the facts, and you can see it unfolding before you. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally agree. It's all just so well-crafted. And so this, this woman who is the host and the narrator, she also wrote and directed the whole series. She's a Brazilian social scientist specializing in in as she puts it collective memory and memory projects which i'm i'm interested in i don't know manu uh myself in the fan community i don't know if you guys are at all familiar with her but this yes. what was that i was just gonna say yeah i'm familiar with her great okay. fan great okay. great advocate for michael and just uh, she's a journalist as well so oh great okay okay i was out of the that's loop that's why on this that. project is so good she's th this is a, prof a professional project <laughs> yes it's incredibly professional it's so well done and i wanted to say kind of bouncing off what you mentioned damien is i think that these are are exactly the kind of projects that shouldn't exist in the world these little kind of wonderfully done micro histories of these little slices of michael jackson history not every project has to be all encompassing, right? It's these fantastic little histories and narratives and getting getting on record the interviews with the people who were there at these interesting moments. That's what we should be doing and doing these projects in the right way. And that's what we have here. It's really exciting. Yeah. And one other thing I would add to it as well, um, just before any of the others jump in, is that I already after two and a half episodes have an extraordinary appreciation for the effort that Spike Lee and Michael Jackson went through to get this video to exist. I mean, we know this is, this is Michael's second, I think Michael's second most streamed video ever, like on YouTube and, and streaming platforms behind Billie Jean. I think it's the second most streamed ever. And the effort that went into actually making it happen, like they were against the odds. They were very powerful influences trying to stop this from happening. And they continued to fight against those and continued to overcome the barriers and make it happen. And, and look what the result is. It's, you know, it's an extraordinary video, a very, very, very important social and cultural comment and illustration of what the song is actually saying. So... You know, it was definitely worth their while to go through those struggles, those trials and tribulations to get it to be filmed because it was, it, there was a lot of forces trying to stop it. And which not only became a really important video within just all of popular culture, but also watching these videos, you realize the impact it had on all the local people there and still has. Just the legacy of this history, you know, of this moment is quite fascinating. Is the statue still there in that spot where he did some of the filming? That was one of the very first sort of MJ statues out in the wild that like people, artists created and installed. Does someone I, know I think if it's, it's still, still there. there. I think MJ Fangirl recently went to the site of the filming of the video and she, I think she posted some footage and pictures and definitely on the balcony, like that balcony's become completely iconic and I definitely saw photos and videos of her up there, but... um. I'm pretty sure the statue is still there. I think there's still an extraordinary amount of love for Michael in Brazil. And the fan the Brazilian fans, like just in social media and in the fan community, they're just amazing. Shout out to MJ Beats while we're here. MJ Beats, they're a Brazilian group yes. that, that does amazing news. Even the news that other people report, they put it in Portuguese so the Brazilian people can read it. Amazing. Hundred percent. So in our last episode we were talking with Marcos Cabota, who has created the documentary Sonic Fantasy. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about the fact that he was not able to include 
music in that documentary, which is such a shame, given that it's about such iconic tracks and the tracks cannot be included. So what I thought was interesting in this series, too, is that, again, it's really videos that are very much focused on one specific song, and yet she also can't use the song. But I think it was almost not even noticeable that the music wasn't there. Um, she did a really, really good job of making that part of it work too. Um, I didn't. So. I didn't notice. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I did not notice that the music wasn't there. Right. Yeah. That's actually funny. Didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't watched it yet, but I'm coming at this from slightly, a slightly different angle. Uh, Elise mentioned the word history, and the word social consciousness have come up a few times as well. Um, Brazil in the, the mid-90s is a, a very interesting place. Now, the reason I'm looking at it like that, one of my other loves in life is Formula One. And in 1994, a Brazilian triple world champion called Ayrton Senna was killed while leading uh, the San Marino Grand Prix in Imola. And it wasn't until he died that people began to realize just how much charity work he did in Brazil by starting the Etten Sinner Foundation and helping out people. Because in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, you can have the richest of the rich in the country and the poorest of the poor, and they're literally just separated by a wall or a stairway or an alleyway, and they're living right next to each other. You can have the favelas right next to a mansion. And so... With Senna's death in, in 1994, Brazil was really on a downer. And even winning the, the Football World Cup in 94 didn't really sort of you know pick up too many spirits enough. So to have someone who was so charity-minded like Michael Jackson come in early 1996 to do this video and put the focus back on Brazil and the plight of, of poor Brazilians as a whole... I think that there's a there's an element of that that I'm looking forward to watching about this documentary, and uh, you can see how many people showed up just to catch a glimpse of the guy. You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. Like listeners, go to the show notes, hit the link. It's a really, really well worth watching docu series. You're gonna. You. I just can't recommend it enough. I'm three episodes in. I love it. It's so good. Huge hats off to the creators because. It's really, really, really something that fans are going to really enjoy and a story that absolutely deserved to be told. And it's something I really enjoy as well is looking at documentaries about, you know, this is what this place looks like now. This is what it looked like then. This is how it was then. This is how it is now. This is another example of that. So I'm sure that I'm really going to enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be curious to see what other topics they tackle in future seasons too. Are there actually plans for that? Well, they're they're presenting this as season one, so I'm guessing, mm. but I, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping it'll turn into a whole thing, <laughs> you know, that'd be great. Yeah, but I have to imagine that just these episodes took a long time to put together. I mean, they're really well done. They have all these interviews, you know, with different people that clearly would have taken a while. And I know at one point yeah. she talks about getting finally getting this one conversation that was you know uh, this kind of revelation to get so i just think about how long she was working to get that to get that story yeah. so well you can't you can't tell your story you can't present a story until you have all the pieces of the puzzle right and like i know that very well in yes. some of the stuff that i'm working on there are some of my most important interviews that i've taken 10 years to get pursuing for 10 years before you actually get the piece of the puzzle that you really needed so yeah bravo to her i mean I, this was at least in production for a year because she talked about going to a courthouse in brazil like physically going to the courthouse to get documents and that was in april of 2021 so at least a year ago right in the middle of the pandemic stuff so she was really getting out there and trying to you know feet to the ground and 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 get the pieces of her puzzle so well we're definitely cheering you on excited about what else is in store and yeah, so moving on, this is a quick item, but worth a mention. There is a, I was called a quote unquote new single out from Jermaine Jackson called Save Tomorrow. And it's coming out June 3rd. And um, this is actually a remastered solo version of his duet, which was re recorded with Teresa Rhodes 25 years ago. So just a little teaser has come out right now. Have you guys had a chance to listen to that? And do you have any thoughts? 
I'll start. No. Okay. <laughs> I will continue. I will continue. And yes, I have watched the <laughs> teasers as they've been coming out. And with the links that you gave this morning and that info, because I wasn't initially aware that this is a uh, like a solo version of a duet that he featured on in the mid 90s. About uh, when was it? It was about 90. 90- Four ninety five, perhaps it was around the era of the awful Sarajevo War, Rwandan genocide, uh, and it was sort of almost like a anthem shining a light on those things. And the video that was made to accompany the song was sort of deemed too sad, and it didn't get a lot of airplay back then even though the single did chart quite well in Germany at the time of release with the links in the show notes go check it out because you can then find the original recording and the video that accompanied it and yeah I'm looking forward to hearing Jermaine's version Jermaine's got a great voice and the production included in the snippet sounds really great like very modern clear beautiful production and the harmonies that Jermaine has, like, you got to love those. So, yeah, it's worth checking out. Excellent singer. And it's also nice to see him back with something, although I haven't seen what it is that he's back with. He, he wasn't very well recently, I, I, as far as I know. He was not part of a, a number of the shows that the brothers did. So if he's, you know, feeling in good enough health and spirits to be back and, and, and bringing us something new, that's, that's excellent. You only want the best for the Jackson family. So that's nice. Mm. I, the only thing I've got to add to it is that I, I I thought it wasn't too long ago that I recently read that Jermaine, whether it was health related or not, was sort of taking a step back from the entertainment industry. So, uh, and that might have been behind his reason not to tour with the brothers. So to see him now coming out or about to come out with another single, um, just surprised me. That was all. But yeah, we'll see how it is when it when it finally. Uh gets released see how it goes well if it wasn't health issues i apologize for saying that it was but that was the impression that i was under that he wasn't that oh well. yeah I, I i'm not sure either way <laughs> yeah um, yeah i don't want to be, i don't I mean, want to be so. i don't want to be giving him a health condition that he doesn't have so um <laughs> yeah i apologize but I, I did hear that so yeah i was also hopefully surprised to untrue. see this but uh, <laughs> hopefully he's in good health either way but yeah, I think it has a great sound. And if you do go to the link that we have in the show notes, it, it actually has a really great, like, long description of the whole history on the original song, um, which is is helpful. And I did go back and watch that original video. And it, Q, you're right, it is really sad. It's kind of depressing. So, <laughs> but it's a great... But it was showing time. actual historical things. Well, exactly. At the time. Exactly. Which were awful. And maybe... This might be, I don't know, because it didn't have any indication in the trailer or the information in the YouTube description, but maybe with the um, horrendous and horrific Russian invasion and slaughter of Ukrainians and the invasion of Ukraine, maybe the timing of this might have something to do with that. I'm not sure. Yeah. You may be it's certain, like the theme of the song would certainly fit that horrendous war that is you know, the poor Ukrainian people are enduring and and being so strong throughout. And yeah, glory to Ukraine, absolutely. But maybe that the timing of that is connected. We will wait and see. It's only uh, comes out early June, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep, June. Well, it's in line with most of the, the Jackson family message as well. I mean, Tito's biggest single from his last album was Love One Another. So, um, you know, same sort of message from the whole family. Always and forever. Great. So yes, definitely check that out. And we'll look forward to hearing the full song. So moving along, we do have a couple of big anniversaries this year. And this will carry us into our main discussion topic for this episode. First of all, we have the Blood on the Dance Floor 25, which is happening as we record this in which, of course, nothing has really come out of the estate for this anniversary. But I don't think we were expecting anything more than that. I will say if you are thinking about Blood on the Dance Floor, you know, there's some great material out there. We did not get a chance that much on the MJ cast to talk about Bryce Nijar's book on the dance floor, which is pretty terrific. So definitely check that out if you haven't. Um, And go play the album if you want and celebrate 25 years. Yay, since the estate will do nothing. And read Damien's book. (laughs) And read Damien's book. Go buy and read Damien's book. 
It's amazing. Yes, please, please do. And so moving right along into our main discussion topic is the 40th anniversary of Thriller, one of the most, if not the absolute most important album of all time, celebrating 40 years this coming November. Just recently, the estate launched their celebration, including a range of products for us fans to purchase. So we're going to definitely do a little deep dive talk about all of this. We have um, a double album coming out. We have some merch. Where shall we start, guys? Who wants to jump in? Oh, I think the the announcement of uh, a double disc album, but not telling you what's on disc two. <laughs> so, hey, come and buy this thing, but we're not going to tell you what's on it. Indeed. Yeah. So we have a really beautiful... <laughs> Actually, it really looks about like a nine ninety nine CD you'd buy in like the bargain bin at Walmart. A double CD for Thriller 40th Anniversary with, as we know, as, as has already, you know, been all the rage on Twitter, a redo of the Thriller album cover design. Um, do we want to speak about this? redesign. There's been a lot on Twitter. I'm sure everybody's kind of said what they had to say. But um, but I can jump in, of course, that the real the obvious reaction here is that they did everything exactly wrong. They took iconic imagery, an iconic typeface and removed the most seminal aspects of this album's look and really made it look like something somebody slapped together on Canva, which has been upsetting to a lot of people, of course. And then they, and I know I want to jump into the details of this much more, but I just want to, to add that the estate not only released this just redone, terribly redone album package, but then immediately the following day released a letter to all the fans telling us that we basically need to chill out over being upset about it. So there's a lot that's been going wrong with this launch already. There's a couple little things I think are going right, but let's first kind of focus on where what's been misguided about this. Um, Damien, I know you have a lot to say on this topic, so I'd love to start with you. For sure. Well, firstly, Thriller is my favorite album ever. My favorite Michael Jackson album, obviously, but it's my favorite album of any artist ever. I personally think it's one of the most important albums to have ever been released by any artist in the history of humanity, and it's the biggest selling album in the history of humanity, which makes it the most commercially viable album in the history of humanity, based on all of the elements that go, that are put together to create the product that is the Thriller album, that resonated with more people around the world than any other collection of songs released as an album ever. That's what we're working with here. It's the biggest album ever. And the album cover is part of that. It's the face of the album. And the album cover is is a combination of elements. It's obviously a photo shoot of which one photo was selected to be, to represent the album. And then it was a typeface and a gradient through the typeface and sizing of the typeface and everything that goes into all of the different artistic aspects, the graphic design, the photography, everything together makes that album cover. That album cover then is slapped on the front of the the album itself, the music, and then is sold. So if you're commemorating the 40th anniversary of that album, that product, exactly the way Michael released it, and you think you need to change it for anyone to care about it, I think you're automatically misguided in in your beliefs. The thing is that the Thriller album, over the course of time, has been reissued twice, once in 2001 and once in 2008. It's been 14 years since the last reissue. And the estate is trying to say, well, this new reissue is for new fans. We want to introduce the album to new fans and blah, 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 new fans, new fans, like... Forget about us, <laughs> the ones who've been here forever, the ones who, you know, 
lived through trials and all kinds of things and were there for real album releases and, you know, bought tickets to the concerts and all that, blah, blah, blah. Forget about us. It's for the new fans. But if it's for the new fans and they haven't experienced the original Thriller, then why not give them the original Thriller? Why not give them the album that we got in 1982 and 2001 and 2008, at whatever period in our life as fans we first experienced this album? We got the real deal. So for me, it's like they're trying. It seems like they're trying to remove the iconic aspect of it and make it something new. That's like the estate version of it, uh, and I just don't like it. In any any of the previous reissues, they've kept the classic iconic typeface. They've never moved away from that. They've repurposed it in different ways. You know, moving it into a different position on the cover, or you know, blacking out the back background and highlighting the actual image of Michael or choosing an alternate image from the photo shoot, but they've never actually changed the branding of the album until now. It just, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense considering that that branding is so synonymous with the album and is so beloved by people around the world. So just on its face value, the image alone, as you said, Elise, has caused a huge amount of uproar because you don't fix what's not broken and the thriller album is certainly not broken so that's a nutshell of what's happened here with with the album and with fans you know across the board expressing their displeasure for the estate to come back and tell us no 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 no, you're wrong we're right this is a good idea and you should accept it i just don't think that really feels good as a fan of someone who's been a fan of this artist for my whole life I don't like being spoken to like that. I don't like being dismissed like that. They don't want to seek the advice of the fans. They don't want to listen to the feedback of the fans. It's like, why are we even here? You know, it's it. it we feel it feels very dismissive. Yeah, a couple of choice lines from the letter they immediately sent to the fan community after the uproar included: "It is very common for artists to make changes to album packaging to mark special milestones like anniversaries, and then." Also, uh, this is my favorite, perhaps, we would encourage you to focus on some of the things that are yet to be announced that are part of this campaign. (laughs) So in other words, stop freaking out about the huge mess step we've made. And let's just focus on this, these other things that that we're suddenly going to throw on the table to distract you from this big mess step. I've seen a few fans kind of out there on Twitter saying that we should chill out and this is not that big a deal. But it really just does feel like such as a deep misunderstanding of the artist they are supposed to be holding up. And it, it really is upsetting on that level. And then we've seen some fans, namely like Dan Villalobos, like immediately come out with these suggested redesigns of what an anniversary package look like, which are completely iconic and which use the strengths of this album, which use the wonderful typeface and make it still look fresh and new, but keep that iconic look. Um, It is possible. (laughs) I, I think Damien has pretty much nailed it when he said, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And Yes, the the typeface and the font that they the chosen for Thriller Forty is a minor detail. At the end of the day, the art that's behind it is the thing that made this album magic. But it, it's just, it, it to me, it's sort of cheapened it a little bit. And yes, we've taken some criticism for having a negative opinion, but at the end of the day, that's that's the opinion that we're we're sharing. This is my personal opinion. It's sort of like, okay, what's this year? This year is the jubilee for Queen Elizabeth. It's like saying, Your Majesty, here's this big, nice, shiny throne, but to commemorate it, we're going to spray paint an office chair gold and have you sit in that instead. But look at this extra thing. It can go up and down. It's sort of like, okay, it's still a chair. It's still something you sit down in, but it's not the same. Thriller 40, well, I I, I don't really know what's coming. uh, None of us know what's coming on disc two. Thriller 25, they at least kept the... uh, yeah, you know, the genesis of, of, of what the album was all about, to, to steal your wording there, Damien. But the mistake they made, in my opinion, with Thriller 25 was all the remixes and the, well, Kanye West, if we could sum it up in two words. But I, I sort of liked the, the Akon want to be starting something as a new song. But the rest of it, you just like, leave it alone. 
Billie Jean is perfect as it is. Beat it is perfect as it is. Why, why do you need to do this? But, I mean, yeah, and like you say, dismissing the fans that have been there uh, that were the reason that this album was so successful because they went out and bought it. To dismiss them like that and say, just hold on a minute, is, is really quite disrespectful. I think the difference between what Thriller 25 is and what the 40th anniversary of Thriller could represent, I won't say should because it's not my choice is what it should be, but I have an opinion. Thriller 25, by putting, first of all, by putting a big number in the reissue of an album, I think is always a mistake because it dates it immediately. It puts it into that year. This is when this this is 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 relevant and not beyond. So the 40th anniversary is 2022 and that's it. It's This is your 40th anniversary edition. Thriller 25 worked in that way because it was the 25th anniversary of the album, but it was Michael using that milestone to reintroduce himself through his biggest album to the general public, knowing that he had other things going on in his life, like a new pop album that he was eventually going to try and release. And in that Thriller 25 album, he stamped it in time. It was a 2008 thing. He even put 2008 in the titles of the remakes. And they're not remixes because he didn't re- he didn't reuse the original elements of the, the songs. They're completely new productions and they're completely changed. And some of the songs like PYT goes and uses Michael's original demo and The Girl Is Mine uses Michael's original demo and Wanna Be Starting Something uses a, a completely new vocal. They're not remixes. It was Michael saying, I'm still a relevant artist. And to celebrate the 25th anniversary of my big album, let's do a new take on my big album in these new versions of the songs from my big album, right? And it it stamped it in 2008 to say, today, right now, I'm still relevant and let me show you. That is not what is happening anymore because Michael Jackson is not alive and he hasn't been since 2009, right? So... Now we're commemorating the history of things that existed and that were created and released while he was here. And if we're doing the 40th anniversary of Thriller, firstly, it doesn't need to be Thriller 40. It doesn't need to have a big 40 on it. It can be like the the Dan Villalobos artworks. It can be Thriller with, you know, a little sticker that says, you know, Deluxe 40th Anniversary Edition. But it doesn't need to be Thriller 40, in my opinion. It's just my personal opinion. And then people will disagree with me. They love the idea of putting the big 40 on there, I personally don't. No, like for Thriller 50, you just call it Thriller Gold or something. Yeah, Thriller know, Gold, exactly, gold yeah. Because, yeah. Like, you yeah. Know, someone suggested that Thriller 40 could be Thriller XL because it's a deluxe, so it's got an extra disc, so it's extra large, but XL is also mm. the, the Roman numerals for 40, right? So it could be that. I just don't personally like the idea of slapping numbers on these things. And and what you said, Thriller Gold for the 50th, that's what it should be, obviously. 10 years in the future, they need to note that down now and say, in <laughs> in 2032, we're doing Thriller Gold. But Should I copyright that idea already or not? Yeah, yeah, you should. Um, but for me, it, it should just be a commemoration of Thriller from 1982. You can release it for the 40th anniversary, but it... I just don't like the idea of 40 dating it. You know, here's here's a little insight for you from when Michael was alive. Thriller 25 was what it was and he and Michael was part of that and signed off on it. The King of Pop album which came out 6 months later off the back of a huge success of the Thriller 25 thing. Thriller 25 was massively successful for Michael. It was one of the biggest selling albums of that year. Sony, on the back of that success, wanted to do a 50th anniversary Greatest Hits album with the fans voting for their favorite Michael Jackson songs and each country would get a different version, the King of Pop album. They wanted to call it the 50th birthday album, not the 50th anniversary album. Michael flipped out about that. I've got several sources from within his camp at that time and he was absolutely livid that they wanted to put 50 on it because he said that his hits are forever and he is forever. And yeah, he's 50 years old, but why do you want to put a King of Pop 50 out? Like that, that doesn't make any sense to him. And to me, I, I agree with that. That's for me, it's, 
he didn't he didn't want a fifty on his on his hits album commemorating his his hits through the years. It wasn't a new product with new material and something completely new for the for the time. It was a commemoration thing, and don't put fifty on it. So, the two thousand one editions didn't have a big number slapped on them. They were thriller special edition, bad special edition, off the wall special edition, dangerous special edition. Could just be thriller deluxe. For me personally, just me personally, and doesn't have to be for everybody, and we can all disagree, but that's me personally. I think that's an interesting point, Damien, that I hadn't really thought about that before, but I, I totally agree with you. Like, why not keep this iconic album just simply feeling fresh and evergreen and not putting a date stamp on it? I think you're totally right. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not right, or maybe there is no right or wrong, but it's how I feel, so to not speak it would be... You know, I'm I glad you're I'm speaking. Enti- I'm, I'm entitled to speak it, but <laughs> I, I certainly accept in advance that plenty of people won't agree with me, and that's totally fine. That's our prerogative, right? As people with the ability to speak freely and express how we feel. I do think that one thing they are doing right with this launch, which I have tweeted about as well, and I'm excited about this, and this is probably the one thing I'll purchase depending on what comes out with that disc number two, which if you guys have speculations, we can talk about, but they are going to be releasing an ultra disc one step pressing by mobile fidelity sound lab of the vinyl of thriller, which looks like it's pretty cool. I didn't really know what this was as far as the mobile fidelity, but I was reading I watched a little video if you guys know the infectious groove podcast um Russ over there is incredibly knowledgeable about vinyl and just all kinds of audio tech stuff um and he sent us a little video that I think we shared on Twitter too about these uh, mobile fidelity pressings that sound pretty incredible and they all so they they do this for a lot of iconic artists and Uh, So this is working from the original master recording and apparently whatever process they use just creates like the best sound quality you can possibly get. So that, and it looks like actually they're going to do, first of all, they use the original (laughs) album art on this instead of the, you know, weird uh, Thriller 40 typeface. And they do kind of a whole package that looks really beautiful um, and a testament to a classic, classic album. Um, Everything just works. It feels important. It's beautiful. It looks really classy. So that I'm excited about and I definitely will be getting. And but that is kind of the, the one piece. I will not be buying the Thriller 40 red sweatshirt. (laughs) <laughs> or any of the other items probably but but that may be we'll see <laughs> yeah the mer- the merchandise is extremely confusing because if you want to talk about the the iconography of thriller you know the photo the font whatever you want to identify as your favorite part of the thriller album cover or none of it is on that merchandise if you're commemorating the 40th anniversary of thriller with literally zero of none, like has none of the original Thriller elements in it. It has just the font with Thriller 40 on it. It doesn't have the album cover. It doesn't have the iconic font. It has absolutely no semblance of Thriller. Can I just have a whinge about the shop while we're on here? Yes. I, I just, uh, look, I, I don't want this to be a, a, you know, a discussion on shitting on the estate, but I just had a look through the shop and... Some of the items, and not just the Thriller 40 items, but I just feel that they're, they're crazy overpriced. Like, I just had a look in the, the Neverland Ranch collection, and there's a mug going in there for 30 uh, sorry $25 US. $25 US for a mug. Uh, that's just crazy talk, in my opinion. And then, uh, yeah, and then th- this apparel that you're talking about, this thre- the, the sweater for Thriller 40... 60 US dollars. See, that I can, that's not too badly priced, but $25 for a mug? Yeah, it's all kind of crazy. But also, $60 for a sweater is, is not so bad, but $60 for a, for a sweater commemorating the 40th anniversary of Michael's most iconic album with no semblance of that iconic album on it doesn't make sense. Mm. <laughs> the, album, the, picture, yeah. the picture isn't on it, the font isn't on it, nothing is on it except the new text. That's, that's all that's on it. So you're not really commemorating or celebrating anything. It's just your $16 text. Like, 
it's just so bizarre. Like the Thriller album is beautiful. I would love a t-shirt with the actual Thriller album cover on it, but we got the clip art instead. Yeah, it is pretty mystifying that they don't have a better shop. I mean, you have, again, like a worldwide fan community just itching to spend money on whatever you you put out there and, you know. But the problem is they're going to spend money on this. Yeah, yeah. Which is to buy it is to feed it and they'll, they'll look at the numbers. They'll look at the data and say, wow, our email blast had all of these Michael Jackson loyalists buying this clip art. We don't have to spend any money on anything in the future. We can just put put clip art out and that's it. Done. Michael himself doesn't have to appear on any more of his merchandise ever again. We can just put out text. $16 a pop, we're going to make millions. It's frustrating. It's very, very, very frustrating. I think I'm, I'm most offended by this because Thriller is his magnum opus. It's his most important piece of art and that no aspect of that art is represented on that merchandise at all it's just weird it's just so weird it just doesn't make sense to me either because they're perfectly capable of doing this kind of thing in a way that works like also just looking back at bad 25 i thought the design for that was fun and interesting and played off the strengths Mm. of that album cover so it's just perplexing to me as to why this one went so far astray Uh, to give this balance there's every possibility that there might be something absolutely amazing on disc two and that, you know, there is an element of wait and see. But, you know, there's been precedence. We've, we've been let down before as fans. So pardon us for being a little bit sceptical about what positives there are to come. Yeah, well, coming from an organisation that's in three days' time about to go to the Supreme Court and argue their right to sell forgeries as authentic Michael Jackson material. I mean, yeah, like you said, we're well within our rights to be a little bit sceptical. But the second disc, can we talk about that? Because I think that is exciting. I mean, it's exciting that that there's a chance that we'll get some of the things that we've had online for many, many years in a good quality for the first time ever. We've never actually had like master quality copies of most of these songs, these which we've had the songs, but we haven't had them shining in the way that they need to shine. Uh, I think that's that's pretty exciting. And this might surprise some people, but I'm actually not that opposed to being given all the things we've already got again in an official package because we've never had them in a concise official package before. So I'm talking about the hot streets, the night lines, troubles, all those things which are from the original Thriller sessions. These are songs that were recorded during those sessions to create what ultimately became Thriller. Some of them didn't make the cut, but they are part of the history and part of the process that Michael and Quincy and Rod and Bruce needed to go through to get to that final product. You need, you need to create some things that, that don't make the cut because that's how you get to the that level of excellence that they're striving for by making these songs and then realizing that some of them aren't really where they need to be and then replacing them with other songs. And I think that there's a bit of a journey that they can take the listener on with that second disc, tying it into some of the mythology that goes around the album. For example, I think, in my opinion, it would be really, really exciting to get demos of all the songs. You know, we've had a short clip of the Billie Jean home demo. Let's get the full thing. The Girl Is Mine home demo with just Michael. Put it on there. We've had it, but put it on there. The Beat It acapella demo, we've had it, but put it on there. These are things that are you find this in one part of Michael's catalogue and this in another and this is leaked on the internet and that's over there and, and this is over here. Bring them all together to tell the story of that album, I, I think. Starlight, the original thriller. Put them all together and allow us to kind of live through the making of the album on that second disc. And then after all the demos of the nine songs... The outtakes, maybe the mythical four, you know, how Quincy tells the story is, you know, we did the album and then we went back and had a good hard look at it and we analysed what we thought were the weakest four songs on our album and we said, let's replace these four with four brand new killer songs and they went back to the drawing board, sourced more songs, wrote more songs and then you ended up replacing the four weakest songs with Lady in My Life, PYT, Beat It, 
and human nature. But let's include those four that got replaced. Like, let's see where this thing was going and let people in the public who aren't hardcore fans like us understand the, where this thing was going. I'm firmly of the belief that Hot Street, had it not have leaked, it could have been a hit on its own because audibly it's not a million miles away from some of the you know modern artists like Bruno Mars, for example, 24 Karat Magic, that album has a similar sound in my opinion maybe my ears are, are whacked out but similar sound to thriller in my opinion hot street in particular is one song which i've since i first heard it back in whenever it was leaked in 2008 2009 i've just thought wow this, this is a hit on its own okay obviously it sounded a little bit dated but 80s music is is never going to die because 80s music is the best music there's ever been and thriller encapsulates that and Hot Street in particular, I think, is one that, had it not leaked, you could stick it out there in the public domain today. Obviously, you know it's Michael Jackson, but if it, even if it was not Michael Jackson, the song on its own is strong enough to be a catchy, catchy hit. And that's one that Michael really loved. Like, you can see Michael speaking in that deposition he gave in 1993, and they're asking him about Hot Street. And on several occasions, he says... Oh, I really loved Hot Street. I really loved that one. But Quincy and Rod didn't think it was as strong as the other songs. But I really loved it. So that's one that Michael really had a strong feeling for. Another one of those songs is Behind the Mask. The only reason that one didn't go on the album was because there was like a, a royalties dispute between Michael's side and the original writers of the original version of Behind the Mask. So there are some songs on there that Michael felt really strongly about that have never been officially released, which, you know, Behind the Mask was remixed for Michael album. Well, we've never had the original. We, we could get that. That would be new. That would be genuinely unheard. So that's exciting. And then I just think bringing all these things together and putting them in the one place, you know, assuming you've got space for probably 16 songs on a, on a disc, if you could bring together the, the most relevant and important and strongest 16 tracks that represent what went into making Thriller next to the final product, I'd be excited about it, really. I, I would genuinely be excited about it. Yeah, and I wouldn't have to look at the uh, album cover to stream those new gems. And I certainly would if they were put out there. So there are elements of excitement. I think there's just it just got off on the wrong foot with that artwork. It really got off on the wrong foot with people who were like, Why? But there is light at the end of the tunnel that we're going to get something special as long as it's done right. And, and as long as it's not a whole second disc of pit bulls and Afrojacks, please, please no. If you're going to do... Oh, here's one point I want to make. I don't want to hog all this conversation or anything, but one other point I wanted to make was I'm not opposed to them doing remixes because, you know, trying to oppose something that's almost inevitable is just a waste of energy. I think they're going to do it. Just don't put it on the CD, please. Don't put it on the physical product. Make them streaming only. Kids are not going to buy a shiny disc that they have no uh, thing to play it on for Pitbull and Afrojack. They're not going to do that. If you think that there's some commercial viability in a remix with a featured artist or whatever, make it a streaming only thing because that's the only way kids listen to music. They're not going to get this this packaging for that. And the Michael Jackson loyalists, the fans that are going to get the physical CD, they're not going to not get it because it doesn't have Afrojack and Pitbull. So just, that's one of the frustrating things. I think Bad 25 was a phenomenal product, like a really, really good effort to bring all of those elements together. But they had two versions of Pitbull and Afrojack, and they had a, another remix of Speed Demon, which is three tracks that took up space where we could have had Smooth Criminal, Dirty Diana, and you know Speed Demon demos instead. And I think that's just, I think it's, misguided if you're going to if you're going to take up space on these commemorative products with things that are only relevant for five minutes on an album that has been you know relevant for 40 years so again that's why i think it shouldn't be 40 and i think it shouldn't have remixes it should be something that can can be be bought in another seven or eight years and still be totally relevant but if someone buys bad with pitbull now they're going to go what the hell is this so my opinion, opinion, opinion. It's just my opinion, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
No, you know, I think <laughs> everything you're saying, Damon, actually gives me a lot. I feel much more hopeful right now. <laughs> you know, it was it's really easy to it has been easy these last few days to fall into this like hate the estate doom and gloom thing. But um, but, you know, you're right. If if they can if they can actually follow through and I think everything you're saying makes so much sense, this could be exciting and I'm just going to have to have my fingers really, really crossed until November or until we hear more about it. And I also wanted to add on this idea and kind of speaking to everything you've been saying about the whole Thriller 40 thing and the remix thing and everything, you know, when you think about the estate, so they're trying to kind of appeal to like the next generation, which I completely get, but When you think about giving a young person this album, just it's exactly to what you're saying. You don't want it to be this bizarre kind of weird warped version of the classic with all the remixes, like you said, are going to get stale and stuff. You want to be giving them the most exciting version of this still classic album, right? And so an anniversary edition is just something that should keep growing and getting better and better and better while retaining its classic core. So it can always be that exciting gift that you do give to the next generation instead of a warped version of the original. So I don't know, but maybe, maybe that's possible. We'll see. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing what's on that second disc, regardless of the disappointment of the way it's being marketed the merchandise and, and the edits to the cover and whatever, the, the content of the actual product and the, the work that Michael put in to bring us the, the, the final thriller, if we can really experience it properly the way we should, then I'm excited about it. Let's see, let's see though. Let's see. Who knows what's going to be on that second disc? Who really knows? Q, you've been very silent over there. Do you have anything to add? I think after hearing Damien talk about possibilities for disc two i'm curious and i will try to be hopefully optimistic that what is included on disc two and maybe also other versions that they haven't announced that they're going to put out will be exciting and yes i think it's great that some of the stuff that has been traded and leaked for many 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 years will hopefully come out in good quality and really the only people that are probably upset about those things being included on it are the ones that were you know the ones that leaked it or traded it or you know gatekeepers of that stuff in the first place it's like well you can't complain about something getting finally released properly if you were the one that was sharing an, a leaked version of it in the first place. So, yes, I'm going to try to be hopefully optimistic about what content is included on disc two. I think it's great about that really good audio quality LP version. That's really good. Maybe one of the unannounced projects attached to this could be finally the remastered thriller film that they went and paid for they went and did they showed it at very limited release for a few people and then never to be seen again so maybe this is the time that they're going to release that i'm not going to hold my breath because they probably forgot that they did that uh, and then they won't even do it but maybe this would be a time that they can do it fingers crossed because deserves to be out there that's something that people want to pay for because it's quality and it was done well apparently from all accounts but their track record is just abysmal with a lot of releases and i just have very little faith that they can put out some sort of product that is going to be amazing again like you said they just started off on the wrong foot and then with the other foot they stepped on it and ground it into the ground all the the valid feedback about the horrendous design elements of this because one their merch is like just awful and i would not pay for it because it looks shit There's just, it's like, honestly, it's like Comic Sans. It's like, why would you replace one of the most iconic 
fonts and recognizable elements with something that is so close almost to Comic Sans. It's so bad. It just is, again, the, the minimal effort. It's like, it's like some boomer intern that, you know, is possibly not even getting paid, but they're so happy to be working for the estate, has just like found this awful font and put a big 40 behind it and are so proud of their work. And it's like, yeah, like examples before, like Dan Vigilobos, the, the absolute creativity that people have shown they can whip up very quickly just is so much far superior. Like retro is in right now, 80s and 90s stuff. And soon it'll be like 2000 stuff that is like coming back into fashion. But like retro is so in. This is such a huge missed opportunity for using such an iconic font and iconic branding and iconic imagery that they have just wiped completely from this. It is just so stupid. So um, I think that is all of my notes. That's it. That's all I've got to say. Q, just to add to that as well, didn't wasn't that same font or maybe a variation of the Thriller font used by Daft Punk for something as well? Yeah, Random Access Memories. And, and they didn't even need to say what it was. Everyone knew that sonically that album was a throwback to that era and especially the Michael Jackson Thriller style. And everyone knew that that was homage to the Thriller font. It wasn't the exact font, but it was very, 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 very Pretty close. close. And everyone knew that they were paying homage to it because it was iconic. And when you do something like that, when you depart from something like that, like you have something so iconic that everybody knows and loves, and then you give something that's so cheap and, and, and nasty to replace it, how can you expect people to not have a sour taste in their mouths? Like, it's, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know if they were expecting us to say, wow, that new font is amazing. I'm glad they got rid of the original Thriller font because, gee, that's cool. Who, who on earth is going to say that? It's just unbelievable to me. Q, Q, by the way, I wanted to add on to something that you said, which I thought was really uh, a good point about the the Thriller remastered video. Um, and you said that, you know, they, they did this and I'd almost kind of forgotten that they'd done it, you know, because it was four years ago, I think, that they did that, right? And you said it was a very limited release and blah, 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 which is all true. Um, the thing that I wanted to add on to what you said was that even more bamboozling and baffling and flabbergasting in the words of Dane that they would have something that is on par with the current market four years ago and put it on the shelf because the longer that they hold those things back the more irrelevant they become it's like you bring it into the current day and age with this incredible remaster that everyone says is amazing and everyone is a very limited number of people but everyone says it was amazing I never, heard, I haven't heard a single bad reaction to the remastered Thriller or the Thriller 3D. Everyone loved it, and it's on the shelf for four years, just constantly becoming a little bit more outdated and a little bit more outdated. And who knows by the time we ever get that, if they don't do it now, and I think they will do it now, so that's good. That's props to them for not just shelving it forever. But if they don't do it now, it's going to become obsolete. And that would be just such a shame to have actually created something that we could all get around and just say, this is beautiful, and to let that become obsolete too. So, I mean, this could be the last chance ever to find a relevant moment to release that stuff, and I hope they do. So, And if they're smart, they'll do it you know, in the very first day of the streaming week in which Halloween falls in. And everyone will go to YouTube and stream the new HD version of Thriller and those views will count towards the charts and the charts will you know, I think Thriller was in the top 20 last year on the Billboard Hot 100 so if they if they have enough momentum around the song and the video and giving people a new reason to go back and watch it because I certainly didn't stream Thriller last year and it still was in you know burning up the charts if they're going to give people a new reason to go back and relive those those videos you know they're going to give themselves the best opportunity to have the best commercial success which Seems to be the only thing the estate actually cares about. So if that's what if that's if that's true, then they should really take those opportunities to 
to put these things out at the right time, in the right way, on the right platforms, in a really coordinated way that helps Michael just rocket back up the charts. Because he's going to rocket up the charts anyway on Halloween with Thriller, but they they may as well maximize it to make that him rocket as high as humanly possible in that one isolated week, knowing that this deluxe album is coming out, you know, two and a half weeks after Halloween. That would be the perfect promotion to launch this whole thing and remind people... So this people, comes out after Halloween. Like, that the, was my question. Like, the deluxe this thriller... Out? 18th of November. Fucking idiots. Oh my God. Like, again, that just shows the stupid timing. Why did they not put this out for Halloween again? Like, it shows to me, this is why I'm not excited about these official stuff. And I get excited about fan projects, like the documentary about the making of They Don't Care About Us that we talked about, like Damien stuff, about, you know, just what fans make. Because... To me, the level of care that they put into this is as simple as the font, as simple as the release date and the good timing of when they can put it out, and they just don't care. They just do not show that they care. Otherwise, they would have done the most obvious things, and they just never do. The thing about that release date is it's not really committing to either thing, is it? I mean, yeah, through that's what I was the song thinking. itself... The, the the song itself is obviously a Halloween classic purely because of the yeah you know the video and the subject of the song and this that and the other but the actual anniversary is at the end of November so yeah, by November 30th, picking a date right? slap yeah and what's the release date you say the seventeenth eighteenth yeah so it's twelve 18th. days before okay the so do you know what the eighteenth is we you know what November eighteenth is don't you that's the date that Neverland was rated in two thousand and three it's just of all I the dates that you could have picked. It's just ridiculous. They're idiots. They're absolute idiots. They honestly do not care. They do not care about the products. They do not care about the art. They do not care about us fans. Show me show me something that proves those statements otherwise. I just think the most resounding thing that they don't care about is Michael. Yeah. They do not care. Which is sad. <laughs> <laughs> on that happy note <laughs> oh and by the way I just want to add this in because I think this is important to bring to the conversation about us bitching about this artwork for the album okay this is maybe something that slipped under the radar of some fans when you know they see negative comments and we don't like it and this is wrong and they should change it and whatever and blah 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 and I understand why people maybe don't like to see a negative reaction to the... Some people out there actually probably liked it. And then that's pooping on their party. And I understand it. And I'm sorry if, if I personally have offended you, but it's just my opinion again. But one interesting aspect of this whole artwork debacle is that the way this unfolded, for those who don't know how it actually unfolded live, was that there was the... There was the Billboard Music Awards with Maxwell doing Lady in My Life. And so it Which, was, how did we not even talk about that? Oh, we yeah, haven't talked about that yet, but we can. We can. Yeah. But, but just that aside, so that was the kind of thing that made us realize, okay, it's Thriller 40 is coming. Like They're, they're, they're creating a bit of a, a groundswell and a movement towards celebrating Thriller this year and probably releasing something at the end of the year. Nothing was officially announced. Then, either that same day as the Billboard Awards or early the next morning retailers online like target and different music retailers they started uploading this listing for a thriller 40 deluxe edition like with a second cd with the artwork that we've all now just spoken about and in the first place everyone thought it was a placeholder artwork like when i first saw it my first immediate reaction was okay they're anticipating that there's going to be a deluxe edition of thriller they're putting a listing up online to try and be the one. Like Target wants you to order it through them. And this music place wants you to order it through them. So they're all anticipating that something's coming. Maybe it hasn't been confirmed yet. And 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 someone has edited this together as like a placeholder artwork until the official artwork comes. And then when the official artwork comes, they'll replace it, right? And... And sometimes people do that. They'll they'll sell things based on the idea that it's coming and then they'll fulfill it when it comes. They'll, you know, print it and send it out and whatever. And if it never comes, then they just refund the consumers because they're only holding their money 
based on a product that never comes. They've never spent it, so they can just give it back, right? Some fans were emailing the MJ Online team. The head of the MJ Online team is a guy named Jeff Jampol. He is the estate manager for a number of legacy artists, including The Doors and Jim Morrison. He also is the estate manager of Janis Joplin. And these artists have really nice deluxe editions of all their stuff. The last thing that came out for The Doors was like multiple discs, unreleased studio sessions, blah, 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 all this authentic stuff, really nice packaging, beautiful. And they have a tiny fan base compared to Michael Jackson, but the work is authentic and it's really beautiful. One of the fans who runs uh, the Behind the Mask fan site, Greg Spinks, he emailed Jeff Jampol to say, this artwork can't be real, like what's going on? And Jeff responded to him saying, we haven't seen any official artwork yet. All that's online is bootlegs, spoofs, and doctored images. Nothing's official. Don't worry, kind of thing. Not an exact quote of Jeff Jampol. Please don't say that that's the exact email he sent, but the words that he used were bootleg, spoof, and doctored images. Merely a few hours later, the estate blasted that same artwork that nobody, including Jeff Jampol, believed was the official artwork they blasted it out on all their socials, on the emails, their marketing campaign. It's everywhere. It's the official artwork. Greg emailed him back and said, um, what? And then he wrote back saying, oh, I hadn't seen the press release, but I guess that's the official artwork. <laughs> like everyone, if, if even those kinds of people, Jeff Jampol is someone who has an extraordinary amount of care for the artists whose estates that he represents. He doesn't, he doesn't manage the Michael Jackson estate. He only manages the MJ online team and I guess consults to the estate, gives them advice if they ask, but I'm pretty sure they probably don't ask because he is a guy who wants his products to be good. And if the estate's asking Jeff Jampol, what do you think we should do? He's probably going to say, make it authentic and make it good. It doesn't seem to be something the estate's capable of because even he didn't believe that this could be the official artwork. So... The frustrating thing is that all it takes is just a tiny bit of care. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily unique to the Michael Jackson estate. It happens with lots of big companies. The big example I can think of is last year, Ford announced the return of the Ford Bronco, and they had the release date in July on OJ Simpson's birthday. It wasn't the best commercial decision. So they had to change that. But the, the, the estate here, and they by, did change by it? picking... Yeah, they changed it. They, they sort of realized their mistake, and they changed it straight away. But the estate here, by neither picking before Halloween or on the actual release date, by going in the middle... The the frustrating thing is that, you know, us as fans, we're we're not paid to do all this, and we we just have this little bit of information that we know or we can easily research. The estate will have someone that that they're paying, if you like, to make sure that details are correct and things like that, and something so tiny and insignificant can become a big thing just purely because they're not taking care over it. I think one thing you're wrong about is that they have someone who's trying to make things right. <laughs> I think that's the one. Well, that's yeah. the one. I don't think they have that division. The quality control division just doesn't seem to exist. <laughs> I think Alrighty, it's... let me rephrase that then. There are several <laughs> in the Michael Jackson world, whether they are fans, collaborators, family or what, who could show them the correct details and oh, give yeah. them the correct care. And like people like yourself, Damien, and and Q and Elise and Jamin on the on the MJ cast, Charlie Thompson, these are just names that come straight to mind because I'm I sort of I know you all now, kind of. But I, you can't tell me that there's not one person within either Sony or the Michael Jackson estate or anyone who's in charge of releasing these music doesn't think about it for a minute or isn't at least someone that's bought the album originally when it first came out or has a memory to do with when that album first came out. So, again, I like to add balance to things. I don't necessarily like to just shit on the estate for everything. So let's give them credit for MJ1, which we spoke about earlier, which is a great thing. But Thriller 40, we're pointing out little things which are annoying us as fans. Now, it's up to you, the listener, I guess, to decide whether or not that's a mistake. But it just so easily could be correct and we wouldn't be having this conversation. The the beautiful thing is they've got six months. And if they have any sense about them, perhaps they will revisit the concept and swallow their pride. I mean, this is asking a lot because this is just not on brand for them, but swallow their pride and say, you know what? We heard you guys. Thriller is the most iconic thing that Michael ever did. 
and we're gonna we're gonna respect that, we're gonna embrace that, we're gonna celebrate that, and we're gonna go back to the original thing. We're gonna put Michael's album cover picture and his face on the merch, not just the text, and we're gonna really celebrate it properly. Because if they've got all these people with these t-shirts with no semblance of the original thriller on it, walking around publicly, what are they even advertising? They're advertising their, their text? Like what what is, that's the whole purpose of merch, right? Is you want to walk around with pride with something on your t you're a walking billboard for the product you love. And if the product you love is thriller, but there's no semblance of thriller on, on the merch, you're not a walking billboard for thriller. You're a walking billboard for the estate and a sixteen dollar font and nothing more. And that's it. So And their graphic designer. Well, Karen Langford in PowerPoint, but yeah. <laughs> and that's a wrap. <laughs> The second wrap. <laughs> the second wrap. Um, That's the crispy chicken the wrap, wrap with spicy sauce. <laughs> Maxwell's performance on the uh, a music show was really good. I loved that special effect of the light, like so reminiscent of the MJ video. It was iconic. I thought his costume was really good. I thought it was really good how he was not trying to imitate Michael. He was. It was Maxwell singing as Maxwell a cover of the song, but with iconic staging. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, it looked beautiful. It looked yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Um, without criticising him, um, I really like would have liked to have seen him beg, you know, the whole mythical begging at the end. But it's not Maxwell style. So I, I actually just listening to you say that now, Q, I actually, mm, I think, okay, maybe they... Maybe that was right to do it the way that they did it. To do an authentic Maxwell cover rather than a yeah. Michael Jackson imitation. So, yeah. I agree. Thank you guys so much for all these amazing thoughts, Damien. You've given us so much to think about. Great thoughts from Q, from Carter. Thank you guys so much for this. Just to wrap up, can each of you let our listeners know where folks can find you online? Yes, this is different than last time because last time we spoke, I said, you can't find me because I really wasn't, I wasn't feeling the social media thing last time we spoke. I'm pretty sure I didn't actually have anything up, but find me on Twitter if you want to see me really speaking a lot of negative things about the Michael Jackson estate. No, I'm joking. I, I do talk about other stuff. At Damien Shields on Twitter, that's the only place you can find me other than my website, which is very rarely updated, only at this point with important updates about Vera's case is DamienShields.com and that's it. Twitter, website, that's it. Oh, and my, well, you can also, if you really um, want to learn about the origins of the Thriller album and how it all came to be, you can listen to my podcast. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, YouTube. It's called The Genesis of Thriller. I'll take you inside the studio with Michael and his team, Quincy, Bruce, Rod, and the rest of them to see how the Thriller album came to be. Or you can read my book, Michael Jackson's Songs and Stories from the Vault. That's available only on Amazon. And Q, where can people find you online? Well, like um, Damien said, there's some differences with his. I think last time I was very Twitter-centric, where uh, my handle is what was the Q? What was the Q? All one word. And different to probably last time I was on the show, I actually don't go on Twitter that much anymore. I don't know why. I think just in a downtime with Twitter. So, But if you did at me and it was like a conversation, then I would I check in like a couple of times a week just to see if I've got any mentions. So I reply. So please, yes, you can reach out to what was the queue on Twitter for me. Um, but I am on Instagram a lot more. I am big hyping up Instagram love at the moment. I'm just enjoying it a lot. Q uh, goes where the cat that, videos are. Q. Where the cat videos are. <laughs> and cat the videos thirst, are. thirst traps and cat videos that'll get me every time. <laughs> thirst traps. Um, yeah, stop sending me the thirst traps, man. I'm not interested in those. <laughs> it was it me. was MJ related. Uh, oh yeah, okay. But yeah. Okay, that's but then I go down a I rabbit hole. It. Then I'm down a rabbit well, that's hole. That's your. That's all on you, bro. <laughs> then the next that one, and then the next one, I'm like, on oh my you. god. And then my. That then, is and all then, on you. And then my phone. Lo- <laughs> and then my phone thinks, oh, he's watched that, so he wants that. Now he wants yeah. that. Oh. That's all on you. Anyway, I'm on Instagram. What was the Q two? So just what was the Q and add the numeral two 
to the end of it. It's like a sequel. What was the Q2? You can find me on Instagram. But if you are going to follow me, and this goes for Twitter as well, although I don't like not as involved in that currently, but especially on Instagram, if you're going to drop me a follow, can you just please reach out and say, hey Q, this is me. I'm, I heard you on the podcast because like, oh my God, the random bot followers that I get is so annoying and oh my God. So just, if you are going to follow me, please just reach out and say, g'day, I heard you on the podcast. You know, I'm just going to, going to give you a follow because then I know you're not a bot and I'm not going to go and block you because I think you're a bot. Maybe because you have a private account, especially if you've got a private account, I will probably just block you because I think you're a bot. So just reach out. I think pretty sure my DMs are open on everything. And send thirst traps, that's fine. So send anything <laughs> else? Dick pics, anything? No, no, it's fine. Thirst traps only. Thirst traps only, okay. <laughs> uh, Carter, where can people find you? On Twitter and Instagram, I'm Charlie W. Carter. Uh, for those of you that like looking at photographs of airplanes or aerial pictures of Neverland, there's at Alpha Charlie Photos on Instagram as well. And I'm also on YouTube if uh, any of you want to follow my flying journey, and it's just Alpha Charlie. And my personal account is Elise Capron across social media. I am also not doing too much Twitter right now. I'm taking a little bit of a pause. But of course, on the MJCast side of things, you can find us at the MJCast.com and on any platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at the MJCast. We are active on all of those platforms and we love to hear from you guys and we reply and engage as much as as we we can if we ever don't please feel free to ping us again sometimes we've just missed a message but you guys thank you so much this has been so much fun it was so so good to have both you Damien and Q back on the show after a while I hope we can get you back on this season we've missed your voices so much and thank you guys for all you do Carter thank you for all the work you put into the show and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and And we have lots of interesting, exciting things to come. Fingers crossed for Thriller 40. I'm going to try to be optimistic. And uh, just hope you guys have a great week and make sure to stay bad. And if uh, I might take this opportunity to wish Jamin and his whole family all the best with baby number two. We hope to see you very, very soon again in season eight. Absolutely. And punch Nazis. And punch Nazis. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say? Is that Q's new sign off? <laughs> I think it is. Punch Nazis. Oh, God. Glory to, Uc- glory to Ukraine and Michael on. Oh, boy. I'm not punching anybody, but I love you, Q. <laughs> <laughs>